I would like to introduce Joanna. And for, for those of you who don't, uh, don't know Joanna, uh, Joanna is a part of leadership team of Illiberate, an anti-human trafficking organization in Romania. Her main focus is being in areas of prevention and advocacy. Yona is passionate about seeing the local church and engage in the communities, including reaching out also to the marginalized and oppressed people. So, Yona, once again, we are very happy that we can have you here uh, for tonight. And now I would, li I would like to ask you to, to start your presentation. Uh, sounds good. Thank you so much, uh, Jakub, for helping us out. Um, so, as my colleague here said, if you have any technical questions, please um, let us know um, and we will try to attend to them. Um, so I do have a few logistic issues uh, that I'm going to go through. Um, I can see your names, but I, um, I do not see you. So this is, this is a, bit, um, a bit odd. I would love to actually um, see you and be able to have this um, a bit more interactive, but we're going to try to do that. So as I am going to go through the logistics, if you could, on the right hand, um, you have a chat option. So if you can just click on that and just let me know um, your first name, where you're from, um, and what area do you do you work in? Um, this is important for me just because this way, um, if I know who's uh, who's participating, I know what are the things that um, I should cover. Um, so a bit of um, a bit of a background. Um, my name is um, Iwana. Uh, I work with El Berare. <laughs> it's a Romanian word that uh, stands for release. Uh, we are an anti-human trafficking organization and our main focus is on prevention. Um, so I started this work um, a few years ago and before doing prevention and advocacy, I actually worked in um, uh, a shelter uh, that dealt with um, victims. So we were caring for survivors of human trafficking. Um, I do not have a background uh, in psychology or in counseling. And basically the things that I encountered showed me uh, the degree of brokenness uh, that is involved when uh, working in this field and with, when dealing with um, these people. So I understood that there, there was um, extra training needed or I needed more information and more background in order to be able to serve these people. At the same time, my role was not um, that of a counselor. I was there as um, an intern. I was there working um, and serving in whatever capacity was needed, but I was also interacting with, um, in my case, women and girls. So... Um, after the experience of working directly with survivors, I came back to uh, my country of origin, which is Romania, and um, I started working in the area of prevention because one thing that was very clear was that instead of treating what was happening, um, much a much easier way to deal with this would have been prevention. At the same time, as I was interacting with um, state authorities. So we work with social workers uh, that work for the state that have been doing this for 20 plus years. And one thing that we realized was that it's really easy to get frustrated on the people who have done this because um, a lot of times you feel like they're not um, able to care for the victims correctly. And one assumption would be that they don't want to do it. But then as we started working uh, more and more in the field, we realized that a lot of the folks that are working with survivors of human trafficking or vulnerable populations have never had any kind of training on trauma. Um, they do not understand what trauma is. They do not understand the, the implications. So um, the material that we developed um, is a material that is not geared towards professionals. So I'm trying to also peek here as you are... Um, as you are responding. So we have someone in the counseling area. I don't know if that means professional counseling or counseling um, within the church, youth ministries, um, pastors, chair of the mission board, wonderful. Um, 
Great. So um, this curriculum is particularly um, for folks who do not have a degree in psychology or in counseling. Um, so what we tried to do was together material and make it as accessible as possible, whether um, we are presenting it to people who, um, as I said, work in shelters or whether we're presenting it to people who just want to help and get involved um, in their church, in their community. Um, we wanted this to be extremely um, accessible regardless of um, the background and regardless of where people are coming from. Um, with that being said, it's really hard to talk um, on trauma-informed care without going into some technicalities. So I'm going to try a lot not to have this a one-sided conversation and just a very technical um, presentation. Um, but another disclosure is that this material usually is presented during three days of training. So we roughly have about 80 minutes and I want to dedicate at least half an hour for questions and discussions at the end because um, a lot of times what I see is that this engaging part um, is where the, the lessons come from and um, I learn a lot from it so I don't want to miss out on that. Um, but as I go through through the presentation, please write down your um, your questions. And um, as Jakub mentioned, um, you already used the introductory chat here, but on your screen somewhere in the middle, there's a Q&A section. So it would be much easier if you use that for the, the questions at the end, um, just so I can follow up and make sure that I don't miss anything on the, the chat. Um, also, we're going to start with somewhat of a long video, um, but it's really important because it sets the tone and it's very much, it communicates the, the heart of this material and the, the heart of why we do these trainings. Um, so bear, bear with the training, um, bear with the, um, the discussions. Um, I'm going to stop it a bit abruptly because it's 20, 20 minutes long, but at the end, if you're interested to see more of it, um, I will send you a link to the, to the video. Um, also, I will share with you some resources that are part of this training, but that we will not um, have time to cover right now. Um, it's on the self-care part. So a lot of times people who attend these, um, these trainings, these sessions, um, they deal with people who uh, have dealt with trauma. Uh, some sort of trauma survivors also, us personally, we have a certain degree of trauma that we've experienced. And this part of self-care is so important. Um, and we know that Jesus took time for himself and he took time to um, basically be replenished. <laughs> um, and that is so important for, for us as well. But as caregivers, as people who give of ourselves, a lot of times it's very easy to just um, ignore that aspect. And unfortunately, we will not have time to cover the whole presentation on that. But that's why I wanted to share with you some resources um, that also deal with this aspect. Um, we're going to try to end on a positive note and on a note that um, is giving hope. Um, but also, I want to give you some actual tools. I want to give you some self-care tests that you can take and then um, some materials that will allow you to put together a self-care plan. So, um, Eliberare is the organization that I work with. Um, we focus on prevention of human trafficking and sexual exploitation. Um, the material that, the large material that I talked to you about um, in, the, um, in the previous minutes um, has a, a lot of specific information about human trafficking, but the part that we're gonna be talking um, about today is specifically on trauma, like general information um, on trauma. And as I said, we're gonna be starting with a video and hopefully it will work. Thank you for being here. Uh, 
I'd like to uh, have us begin exactly where we will end with a series of images about the human condition. These are photographs by Lee Jeffries, who films adults who are homeless and children who are homeless on the streets of Los Angeles and London. And the metaphor of homelessness will be a bit, a bit of what we'll be really addressing throughout this talk. I'm gonna give you a bit of history. I'm a clinician and a developmental researcher in the field of psychology. And for reasons that will likely become clear in the next few minutes, I've taken my entire lifetime of, as a professional over 40 years, focusing primarily on issues and, and places where there is exceptional suffering. So I've worked in prisons, I've worked in uh, oncology units, psychiatric units, sexual abuse treatment programs, and for five years, I worked and lived full time on Skid Row in Los Angeles, working with homeless adults. For the last 20 years, I've had the remarkable privilege of working with street dependent teen, primarily parents here in Spokane, who come from histories of abuse and neglect, often leaving home at about the age of 11 or 12, and then showing up pregnant and having a child maybe at 13 or 14. And this is the population I've had the remarkable privilege of working with. So I've run groups for 20 years and in those groups I hand out three by five cards to every member at the beginning of each group. And I say, I want you to write down on this card one or two sentences that describe for you the voice you hear in your head that you wish you didn't have to listen to. I do this with every group. And one year I asked uh, one of the groups if they'd be willing to let me share these and they said they would. But every time I do a group, as they hand these in, the message is almost always the same. So here are some very typical responses. You are damaged and not worth what undamaged people are worthy of. You're dirty, no one could ever love you. You don't count. You're only good for sex. You're a failure, you always let everybody down, you will never be loved. You're not good enough, no matter how hard you try, you can't do anything right. You don't have a chance, you are going to be left all alone. Now given their histories, these internal messages that they carry through the day make a lot of sense. I've also had the privilege for 10 years to teach a course at Gonzaga University titled The Psychology of Intimacy. And you can imagine at the beginning of each semester, I have the students utilize a three by five card and write down one or two sentences that describe the voice in their head that they wish they didn't have to listen to through the day. And again, I was given permission to read these out loud. You're not good enough for anybody. People who say you are aren't telling the truth. Nobody really cares about you. The ones that tried to care, you've pushed away. You're not worthy to be loved. You will never be loved. You will always be alone. You'll never accomplish anything. You never do enough. It's only going to get worse. You're not good enough for anybody. No one could ever truly love now, the first question I need to ask you is, do you see much difference between these high-risk teens and these so-called low-risk 22-year-olds at a major university? Do you see much difference in their internal world? And I have done this with psychologists, ministers, educators, social workers, 
parents in all walks of life on three different continents, I guarantee you the answers are almost all the same. We're going to skip a little bit. Five years, five freaking seconds, right? I walked into a classroom with Frank Kemper, my first clinical professor, and in a few minutes after an introduction, he made the he spoke the following sentence, and it was nine words. Every person you will ever meet has infinite worth. Every person you will ever meet has infinite worth. Every person. you will ever meet. Has infinite. Worth. In those five seconds, my worldview didn't just shift, it shattered. And quite literally, I've never been able to see people the same way since. Because before that, I'd seen people as okay and not okay and cool and groovy and not so cool and groovy. And I had them in these categories that I thought really made life make sense. And they were all highly conditional and quite suddenly, I realized that no person is worth more than any other person. In fact, if I were to define evil, it would be the belief that some people are worth more than other people. And when we institutionalize that, it really becomes evil. Because all of us underneath all that exterior share this miraculous, infinite worth. About 10 years ago, I have a good friend in Australia, Philip Marshall, and he said something that struck me as almost exactly the same as what Frank Kimper had said 35 years before. We each matter, and we matter absolutely. One of my major mentors, a man I never had the opportunity to meet, Thomas Burton, Trappist monk, lived much of his adult life in Kentucky, was standing on the corner of Fourth and Walnut in Lexington one day and was just watching people pass by and had this epiphany. And he wrote this, at the center of our being is a point of pure truth. It is like a pure diamond blazing with the invisible light of heaven. It is in Everybody. I have no program for the seeing. It is given. The gate of heaven is everywhere. The gate of heaven is everywhere. So Merton was saying that we have within us, each of us, this unrepeatable, fragile jewel. And then he goes on to say, there is no program for its seeing. There is absolutely no formula. There's no five bullet points. There's no seven special steps. Infinite worth is just something that when we begin to see it, we begin to see it everywhere. Okay, so thank you for, for bearing through, um, through the video. Um, basically, one thing that we understood before we started talking about trauma and we started talking about um, what our role is as caretakers um, is that we need to, um, to level the ground. And as I said 
um, the seminars that we hold, the trainings that we hold, um, do not necessarily um, involve people that have the same worldview or the same faith as we do. Um, so one thing that we want to make clear every time that we present this, and I know I, I speak as um, I speak in plural, um, so I'm talking about um, the um, the values and the, the organizational standpoint. We start with this. Um, there is no person that does not have infinite worth. Um, and that means the people that are traumatized, the people that sometimes behave in ways that are um, unacceptable or um, ways that we don't understand. Um, and it's also about the caregivers that we talk to that may be... Um, state officials that have um, been doing this, as I said, for 20 plus years who are um, tired and, and bored of doing this and who don't believe that they can have an impact. And that also means um, each and every one of us. So we do not lay eyes on anyone that God doesn't profoundly love, that God doesn't profoundly um, see as worthy um, of our time and of our efforts. So um, we, as we, we set the, the base, I think, um, and the video continues actually, but I think one of the, um, the toughest things to believe, um, especially after you've been working in, in this area, is that what you do matters. Um, so the video talks about those um, studies um, and those internal voices that people hear. And we saw that um, people who are in a continuous state of traumatization, um, like homeless people, like victims of human trafficking, um, like people who are in um, abusive relationships where there's abuse, um, they hear this voice. Uh, but then you look at those um, students that actually uh, Ken Hoffman calls um, non-vulnerable um, and they hear, hear the same voices. <laughs> and then he goes on to, um, to say that that's actually a voice that's very common and at, at a certain point, um, maybe we've, we've dealt with it. Um, so these are some of the, the lies that <laughs> uh, if we do not um, single out from the start, uh, then we won't have the, the same foundation. Um, but this is, this is our core. Uh, we totally believe that everyone um, is loved and deeply loved by, by God, regardless of what they've experienced and regardless um, of what they've done or has been done to them. Now, with that, uh, the next important uh, step is to figure out what our role is. So I mentioned that um, we will not be positioning ourselves as professional um, help for people who have uh, gone through trauma. So after this course, this doesn't mean that we can go ahead and do professional counseling or substitute um, the services of a, a psychologist of a, or of a um, or of a counselor, but these are some of the things um, that we will be able to do and that I believe falls within our role. We have a very important role as, as caregivers. Um, and the first and foremost is to instill hope. So um, even though we will not be going into clinical issues, one thing that we can do, um, all of us can do is to look beyond the past and the present. Um, and set this vision for the future that can be different uh, from what the, the traumatized person has experienced. Um, another very important role is to have patience. So if we can become professionals in anything, it's um, professional um, waiters, I guess. Um, it, there's a lot of time that's involved and we're actually going to talk about um, timing and what does it mean and how long does it take for a person who has experienced trauma to get over that trauma. Um, and one thing that is um, very important is the aspect of patience. Uh, we are hope givers. Um, and a lot of times when you deal with trauma, um, you'll see that it's a very hopeless um, place, especially for people who have experienced repeated, who have experienced repeated abuse 
um, it's very hard for them to see hope. Um, but as um, believers, we know that there is hope uh, beyond what we what we can see. Um, and that's something that is very important and that we bring to the table. Um, also, our role is to show love and it's to, sh to show love um, regardless of the circumstances. So we're going to be talking about some of the effects of trauma. Um, and that means that the people who has experienced trauma a lot of times will act in ways that we um, don't necessarily agree with um, and that are hurtful towards us, towards the people that are trying to actually help. So how do we continue to show love? Also, our role is um, to become alongsiders. So we're partnering with the people that have experienced trauma to recover. Um, and we come alongside of them as people who befriend them, as people um, who actually they can trust. So trust is going to be... Um, like a red line um, when we discuss about trauma because trauma means um, that trust has been broken. And one of our roles is to be regaining or rebuilding that trust. Also, we are called to offer safety. And um, especially when we uh, talk about um, these things and we mention safety when it comes to human trafficking, right, the area that we um, work in, this doesn't mean replacing yourself um, for the police. So we definitely understand what the, the boundaries are. But we need to be uh, people of a safe place. We need to create the space in which people can be vulnerable, in which people can tell their stories. And we're actually going to go back to how we can do that. Also, our role is to not do certain things. So our role is not to be the savior. I think a lot of times, um, in certain areas, we feel like we need to go in and rescue and save. And we have this, this verbiage and these words when actually we, um, the fact that we know who the savior is, is the most important thing. We do not have to substitute ourselves um, for being a savior, savior. We do not have to um, make decisions for the person who has, has been through, through trauma. But what we need to do is, as I said earlier, come alongside of them and be their partner. Also, uh, what we are not called to do is position ourselves as superior. The video mentioned th mentions this as well. Um, there, this, the fact that we haven't experienced certain things doesn't make us better. It just um, means that we have experienced a different kind um, of life so far. But Again, that doesn't position us as superiors. We come into this um, as, as partners um, and as people who have exactly the same, the same worth. And then um, this is all about, it's all about empowering. So um, if we find ourselves in the position where we just want to do the things for the person that we're helping, that means that we need to take a step back, reevaluate boundaries, um, and go from there. So with this, let's see what does this, uh, what does trauma actually actually mean? So um, a more technical um, presentation or um, definition is this, right? So you deal with traumatic experiences that are dehumanizing, they're shocking, they're terrifying. Um, and a lot of times they mean the betrayal of a person um, or an institution. These are people that usually you should trust, right? Um, it comes from a person of authority or from an institution that is positioned as an authority. So that's why the, um, the trust is broken. Um, also, trauma can involve um, or will involve wounding experiences. And there's different kind of experiences that can uh, cause trauma. So um, we will make a difference uh, between complex trauma and interpersonal trauma and trauma that um, is um, not, that does not involve um, relationship. But one thing that is general, uh, when somebody experiences trauma, um, they're going to feel like they're powerless. Uh, they're going to feel like there's no hope. Um, and basically, even though the, the event may not be life-threatening, that's how it is perceived by the person that is experiencing it. Um, 
there is a continuum of traumatic events and just a little observation. Some of the, the slides also contain some information in Romanian. I apologize for that. But um, most of them you'll see there, um, they're also translated. Um, so this continuum, there are different, different forms of trauma that one can experience. And one thing that we need to understand from the beginning as is that to a certain extent, we've all experienced some sort of traumatic um, event. So the first type of traumatic event is the single impersonal um, event. So this can be, for example, natural disaster, right? You are caught in a storm or um, something happens that does not involve another person harming you, but yet it is still um, traumatic and it still very much um, affects you as an individual. Then there are single traumatic events that are interpersonal. So um, this, an example of this would be uh, someone experiencing a beating or um, a rape um, or any kind of, of assault where there's one perpetrator and it only happens um, once. Then there are um, trauma, there are trauma experiences that are um, multiple interpersonal, but there's just one perpetrator. So for example, if there's um, abuse that happens in the family and it happens um, repeatedly uh, along the years, but there's just one person who is um, inflicting that abuse. And then um, there is multiple interpersonal traumatic experiences that have multiple perpetrators. Um, and these are the types of experiences, um, of traumatic experiences that you deal with when it comes to, um, to human trafficking survivors. So definitely these, um, these traumatic experiences, um, they're life defining. So the way that, um, or the, the impact that these things, um, these events have um, defines how you um, view life. You, there's a shift in how you perceive yourself and there's a shift um, in how you perceive others. Um, we've, talk, we've talked about the fact that there's a constant um, sense of lack of power. So you feel powerless, you feel like you cannot change whatever is happening to you. You feel like the um, situation that you're in is permanent and will not change, even though the traumatic event is happening for, it has a, a beginning and an end. The way that it's being um, perceived and the way that it's being lived um, is as if this is a continuous um, state of fear, powerlessness, and hopelessness. Also, the important um, aspect of um, authority and how does authority play into this. Um, I'm gonna share a little bit about the experience that we deal with. So um, with human trafficking, we see that a lot of times the people who are actually the abusers are the people that should be offering the, um, the safety or the, uh, the protection. So whether it's about, whether this, the, the events are about children who are being trafficked by their own parents or whether they're spouses who are exploiting their spouses, a lot of times um, this trust is broken in such a way because um, the people where, who should be your, your safe place are the ones who are actually inflicting um, the damage, so to speak. Also, um, when we talk um, about trauma, when we talk about the, the multiple interpersonal um, stories, we realize that there are also other people involved. So um, trauma happens within the community. Um, it happens um, with people um, who in a way or another become part, part of your life. So, um, Okay. So with this, um, what are some of the what are some of the symptoms? And this um, applies to um, to all sorts to all the the types of interpersonal trauma. So first of all, there's intrusion, um, and this means flashbacks. This means numbness. Um, so sometimes 
um, if you are, if you have dealt, and I'm assuming that all of you have dealt uh, with someone who has experienced interpersonal trauma, um, sometimes you talk to um, the survivor um, and they just seem like there's nothing. They do not feel anything. They just seem as cold as a rock, so to speak. Um, this is one of the symptoms of trauma, actually. There's an emotional detachment that needs to happen um, in order for them to be able to protect themselves. Um, there are also triggers that we need to be aware of. So these include the loss of control, um, the, lo the, the sense of um, differential in power. So if somebody um, poses as an authority, um, if somebody comes in very, very strong and position themselves as above, that can totally be a trigger um, for the person who has experienced trauma because, um, as mentioned before, a lot of times trauma is inflicted by exactly those people um, in the authority or in the, the power position. Another trigger is the lack of predictability. So these things are important to know because um, sometimes as we try to reach out to um, people that we're trying to help, one thing that happens is we come up with ideas and we say that we're going to be doing um, one thing, but then uh, we feel like it would be really nice to uh, maybe change the plan or do something else. And even though the intentions are really good, these can actually be um, triggers for the people that we are trying to assist. Um, another, system, uh, another symptom when it comes to, um, to trauma is amnesia. Um, so again, an example from, uh, from our work, um, whenever we have uh, people coming out of sexual exploitation, um, the police is very eager to talk to them because obviously they have a trafficker to catch or perpetrators to catch. Um, and they're very, very interested in finding out the story. And as the victims are being interviewed, actually their stories change. And um, a lot of times police uh, personnel or people who do not necessarily have um, the training in trauma think that they're being lied to. But actually um, amnesia, partial or complete amnesia of the traumatizing um, event is one of the sy symptoms of um, trauma. Also behavioral problems, and I've mentioned this, the fact that um, sometimes victims of trauma will um, behave in ways that we might find as unacceptable. They may be violent, they may be rude, um, they may be using language that um, we do not appreciate. Um, but this is very much a symptom of trauma because um, there is a lack of control of impulses. This can also include um, different um, different problems with um, goodness. So, for example, um, anorexia is one side a side um, um, effect of trauma that we see, um, and it very much feeds into the the control issues that survivors have. Um, also, there are signs of self-destruction. So we will see a lot of people who have experienced trauma who are, for example, cutting themselves. So um, these symptoms, a lot of times they are um, in a way assigned to bad behavior um, or they're assigned to um, people who have a dysfunctional um, behavior. But actually, they can be uh, clear signs that um, that person has experienced some sort of trauma um, or abuse. Um, also, another symptom of someone who has dealt with trauma is the way that they regulate their emotion or the way that they actually do not um, regulate their emotion. It's very hard um, for someone who has experienced trauma to actually express what they feel because there is a combination of feelings. Um, from anger to fear, we were talking earlier about hopelessness, um, and all these things, if you do not know how to regulate them and express them, they can come out as um, being rude or being aggressive or not wanting help. But actually what they are, they are a cry for help. Um, when dealing with trauma, it is very common to also see other types 
of, uh, of problems such as depression. Um, people who have dealt with trauma a lot of times have the same uh, symptoms as, pe as people who are dealing with the loss because they have lost something. They have lost um, a part of themselves in the traumatic experience or they have lost um, someone that the perpetrator the way that they saw the the perpetrator before also there is anxiety that is connected to trauma um there's rage um and a lot of times all these feelings if they are being channeled in a positive way they are actually um steps towards towards healing what is important is to know how to manage these um these reactions and rest rather than take them as being um, channeled towards you um, to actually help, um, help people um, regulate them. And I keep saying um, regulating emotions. So pinpointing what exactly is the root cause of a reaction, this is what, what I'm referring to. So um, if somebody just blows up in rage, um, chances are that it is not about the food that has been served to them and that um, at first sight is what made them react that way, but it's about um, what has happened to them um, that got them into the situation um, that they're in. Also, um, it's very important to acknowledge the role of shame. Um, shame plays a huge part um, in trauma. Although people um, have uh, or experience um, certain things that are in inflicted upon them, um, shame is always um, a part of the problem. So if you have experienced trauma, you have definitely experienced shame as well. Shame as well. And how does this actually manifest? It's part of the voices that we've heard um, in the video. So shame sounds like this. Uh, why did I allow this to happen? And this might be a small child who has been abused. Um, and this is what shame does to them. Why didn't I run? Um, and why did I allow um, this to happen for so long? If somebody deserves to be hurt, I actually deserve that. And then the, the voices that we've heard in the video this happened to me because I do not deserve anything good. I do not have worth. I am not worthy of love. I cannot be um, recuperated. I cannot um, actually experience healing. I do not expect anything good in the present because everything that has happened in the past has been bad. So all of these things, um, what they actually express um, is what shame puts upon the person who has experienced trauma. This is very important to take into consideration when dealing with, um, with survivors of trauma um, because we need to counteract these, um, these lies. Also, um, another, um, another uh, thing that can happen or another... Um, reaction to, to trauma is a form of narcissism. So um, this is in a way a function that helps people deal with, um, with abuse. Um, but the way that the, the survivor uh, position themselves is, you know, this has happened to me so that it wouldn't happen to someone else. And in a way, um, the people who have experienced trauma end up um, in a way motivating what has happened to them in a positive way just so they can um, they can deal with the experience so what are some of the the vulnerability factors that we need to take into consideration so we may be seeing the symptoms um that we that i've mentioned um a bit earlier so we see someone who's um, coming in who doesn't re who isn't really able to tell what has happened to them. Um, we know that there was another person involved that did something to them, but they can't actually recount them because of um, the um, effect of amnesia, for example, or um, dissociation. What are things that we should look for um, that would determine whether that person is um, that 
that that person is more vulnerable, that they present more vulnerability factors. So one of the, the first things that we look at is their family. So um, we've heard this so many times um, and to a certain degree, um, I think it's, it's valid for all of us. Um, the things that we deal with a lot of times come from um, the way that we've been dealt with by our parents or by um, other people. Also, um, it's very much about how we've been raised. So if there is um, a history in the family of mental illness, um, for example, this is definitely a vulnerability factor um, that we need to take into account. Also, if there is cumulative traumatization. So one of the things that we see a lot um, when we um, deal with survivors of human trafficking is that abuse starts from the family. Unfortunately, um, the women, for example, that we um, serve in a partner shelter, um, they end up being exploited and, and being trafficked. But the first time that they've experienced sexual abuse was actually in their family by people um, who are close by, either family members, um, close family members or extended family members. And in a way, abuse is already um, normalized because it has happened and trauma has been um, a part of their, their everyday life. Also, um, the fact that when trauma happens, um, there's a continuous threat over the life of um, that individual. And that is just, it might just be perceived. Um, but again, when trauma happens, a lot of times um, there are threats. So um, what we see in, um, in this area of sexual exploitation is that um, women who, um, it's women and men who are victims, but we work specifically with women and girls. So one of the things that they're being told a lot of times is if you do not do this, um, then we are going to kill you. So that may not be um, true all the time because obviously that's a threat that's being um, repeated, but that is very much internalized and that becomes the reality of the, the person who is experiencing trauma. Um, also, the part of dissociation. So if we are dealing with someone who um, does not talk about their um, their experience in a way where they're internalizing it, um, that is very much a, a vulnerability factor. So what happens is that in order to cope with the abuse um, or with the trauma, whatever um, it may be, um, people or survivors, um, well, while they're being traumatized, victims of trauma, and then when we're, we end up working with them, survivors of trauma, um, they start to recount stories of alternate persons. But what we end up realizing is that the stories about the friend or the stories about the sisters um, are actually the stories of the survivors themselves. Um, and that is a coping mechanism that helps people deal with what has happened to them um, and in a way to keep part of the, the innocence or part of the, um, their identity pre-trauma. Um, Another vulnerability factor that we need to take into account is the lack of social support. So trauma a lot of times happens to um, the marginalized, the people that do not have um, the security um, circles around them, the security bar barriers. Um, we see that traffickers prey on um, people who don't necessarily have a family that's very involved and who don't necessarily have um, a lot of friends who are right there um, and who care about the, the person that's going to become a victim. Um, we see that bullies, a, a lot of times, um, they pick their victims um, based on the fact that they seem like there's no one who's going to stand up for them. So the lack of social support, the lack of community is definitely one of the, the vulnerability factors. And then it's very important to understand that um, gender is also a vulnerability factor. Um, when it comes to sexual abuse, when it comes to trauma, 
um, that deals with um, this side, most of the victims um, are women and girls. This doesn't mean that it does not happen to men or boys. No, by no means. Actually, the numbers are growing. Um, but in some, uh, some parts um, of the world, it's more dangerous to be um, a woman or a girl than um, to be a man or a boy. And I think that is um, very true um, in, even in communities. So maybe we think that if we live in um, a civilized country in Europe or in the US, that's not the case. Um, but we need to understand that there are still communities, isolated communities, uh, where that's um, definitely the case. If we feel like um, we're doing good um, in that area. Now, um, what are some of the um, effects of trauma? So, um, the, the first thing that, that ha happens with, um, with someone who has experienced trauma is the alteration of how they see um, different people, including themselves. So first of all, uh, the first major alteration is the way that victims see their perpetrator. Um, maybe we do counseling um, in church and somebody comes to us um, and they don't necessarily want to talk about um, abuse that happened, but they want to talk about you know, feelings of um, of shame or problems that they have with um, one of their parents or um, I don't know they don't necessarily refer to um, to some something traumatic and then they start talking about someone who sounds absolutely um, fantastic but as as we um, develop our relationship as, and as we continue our conversations with this person, we realize that something is off because, for example, this kind stranger um, who has helped them and who has given them the opportunity to go to school um, is also a person who um, makes them um, perform chores um, that are very exhausting. Um, and even though this is the only person that feeds them, um, this is also a person who gives them a quota um, and they need to come up with a certain amount of money or they need to perform a certain amount of tasks in order for those things um, to be given to them. So it's very common uh, for trauma to change the way that the victim sees the perpetrator. Um, we talk to women and they do not talk about their trafficker. They talk about their boyfriend. And when you start talking to them and realize that this is actually the person who has been exploiting them, who has been trafficking them, um, you wouldn't know that if you just took it at face value and you said, oh, so your boyfriend brought you to this country, your boyfriend helped you get this job and so on. But this is an effect of trauma. And I think, um, most of most of us, if not all of us, have heard of the Stockholm syndrome, um, where because of the the effects of trauma and because of the alterations, um, the perpetrator is actually being seen um, as a hero, as a as a savior, as someone positive. Um, the second um, effect that I want to talk about is the alteration of how the victim sees themselves, and this is. Um, a huge issue that we see. The fact that a lot of times, actually the victims do not see themselves as victims. Um, and part of the reason for that is the shame. The fact that they understand that what has happened to them um, is something um, incredibly shameful, is something when it comes to sexual abuse, um, it's something that they were probably taught that it shouldn't happen. Um, and now inst instead of identifying themselves um, as victims, what happens is that they see themselves as the unworthy person, as the person who caused this, as the person who has brought this upon themselves. Um, so this is a huge issue because if somebody doesn't see themselves um, as a victim or as someone who has gone through something horrible, chances are they're not going to be very eager to receive help because they do not need the help, right? If nothing bad has happened, then why would they need help? Why would they need to, um, to come forward? 
Um, then you have the alteration of how um, they see other people. So one of the vulnerability factors, the lack of community. Um, and one of the things that happens, especially in complex trauma, there are multiple perpetrators that are coming and inflicting trauma upon this, this one person. Well, how, how open does this um, particular individual become to receiving help from basically strangers? Because until we build that relationship of trust, um, that's what we're going to be to them. We're just going to be some strangers. So we need to be very much aware of the fact that trauma affects the way that um, that survivors see, see us um, as the caregivers, as the people who um, are trying to help and who are trying to, um, to reach out. Then also, um, there's more than just um, shame, there's chronicle shame. So if we wanna deal with the effects of trauma, we need to debunk all those lies that um, shame has um, reprogrammed the, the brain of the person who was traumatized. So uh, just like um, trauma um, remodels the brain, basically it rewires the brain, um, the same way uh, we have this, uh, this role um, to come and take out the, the lies that chronicle shame um, has placed into or upon the, the survivor. And we need to debunk all those myths that this person has inflicted this, they've, they've brought this upon themselves, the fact that they um, deserve this, um, and many other lies that I've already mentioned. Now, when we talk about healing, uh, so the title of this slide is healing, we talk about trust. So if you look at the screen, one of the persons there is the person who has experienced trauma and the other person is you who are trying to reach out. Well, one thing that's very important to know is that trust has been broken. And the example that we have here is um, trafficking, right? When human trafficking happens, basically there's a betrayal of trust. The person who has experienced that does not trust anyone because they've been uh, brought into this situation because they've believed some promises that ended up not being true. They've been betrayed by someone really close. They've been used and abused for the gain of others. Now, on the other hand, if we look at care, right, or after trauma care, it also happens within the community. So we need to replace the lack of trust with respect and love. The fact that people have been betrayed, we need to respect that with the power, with um, empowering them to decide for themselves. And instead of um, having a space in which they're being used and abused for um, the gain of others, what we need to build is a safe space. So this is how trust is being rebuilt. If trauma has happened um, in the community, if trauma has involved people, um, healing involves people as well. Now, I was mentioning that um, this takes time. And one of the first questions um, that we get is, so how long does it take for um, someone who has been trafficked, for example, to uh, get back on their feet? Um, and that's a question that's very hard to, um, to answer because first of all, what does it mean? How much does it take for someone to, to get better, right? Um, let's define better, let's define success, but we're not gonna go um, into that right now. But one thing that we refer to and one tool that we use um, is the grief timeline. So um, with trauma, a lot of times, um, as mentioned before, there's a sort of loss that happens. So this continuum, we can also um, use when it comes to trauma. So experts say that um, dealing with shock takes um, anywhere from you know, zero to 10 months. <laughs> uh, this means that that person needs to accept the reality. Um, they need to 
actually understand what has happened to them, acknowledge that the, the experience, the bad experience, the trauma has happened. Um, then the next stage is the disorganization. So um, it's the time when people just deal with the pain. They experience it. Um, life doesn't just go on as, as usual. Um, and this can take anywhere from, you know, six um, to 18 months. Um, the adaptation to the new environment and then the reorganization, which means figuring out how to do life post-trauma, um, is the continuum. And here experts have said that um, it can take up to 42 weeks. Now, here's the key to all this. It would be really nice if we could take people and put them on this timeline and say, oh, so we have six months to deal with this and then another year to deal with this. But actually dealing with trauma and dealing with grief and dealing with loss is not a linear process. So somebody can be doing really, really well. They can probably feel like they've went through the shock through the, um, they've experienced um, the pain and all the disorganization has happened. And now we're putting, um, we're taking small steps towards um, reorganizing um, and towards figuring out how to, to move on. But one trigger that we mentioned, whether it's um, a feeling that there's um, loss of control or um, there's something that brings them back to um, the moment of traumatization can take them back to um, the shock period. So this timeline to simply say that there is no timeline <laughs> when dealing with this. Um, there is no timeline when trying to figure out how much do you need to uh, accompany someone uh, once they've experienced trauma and once you've started working with them towards healing. Uh, people process differently and their timing is different. So I don't know if you've experienced uh, folks who come in and they are very lucid and they're very um, coherent and they talk about what has happened to them um, and they have a plan about how they're going to move on and they seem like very put together. And then all of a sudden something minor happens and then they finally start processing what has happened and they start processing the pain. And it can be something um, as minor as a word that's being said to them, but that's actually something that triggers them and takes them back to um, dealing with, with the shock and the pain. Um, also, there's no simple recipe to going from one step to the other and actually um, trying to rush through this. So completing a counseling program of 12 sessions in which we're going to be building on this, this, and this, that's actually not something that is recommended. So people need to have the space um, to deal with this in their, in their own time. And they actually need to um, experience the pain because if they don't, there's a very high chance that they're going to just be um, going back um, in the process. Now, um, as I mentioned, as um, people who are not offering professional help, as people who are coming alongside those who are grieving, those who have experienced trauma, um, there are certain things that we cannot do, but then there's also things that we can do. And one of the um, easiest um, or the simplest, because it's not easy, but one of the simplest um, things that is um, available to us is helping people to um, tell their story. So um, a lot of times just sharing what has happened to someone is... Um, it's freeing. It actually gives a sense of release and it also gives us the opportunity to actually better understand what has happened and to accompany, accompany them um, in the process. But this can be very delicate because if somebody tries to tell their story and we are not connected and we do not understand what's happening, we can actually take them back um, a lot in their progress and we can determine them not to want to tell their stories and not to want to accept the help. So these are a few steps um, that we've put together so that um, whenever we have maybe a counseling session or whenever we are 
maybe meeting with someone um, for coffee and they start telling us some things because we are the, the safe person and we are the, the people that they know are going to be praying for them and not judge them. Um, these are things that we can do. So it's very important to respect um, everybody's pace. Um, don't try to rush them. Um, maybe even um, program it so they don't have to tell their story um, at the same time. So for some people, traumatization has happened and has started in their childhood and it hasn't stopped yet. <laughs> so um, going through years and years of abuse can be very overwhelming, not only for, for them, but also for you. Um, so create a space where it's okay to, to pause um, and let them pace um, themselves where it's, it's comfortable for them. Also, um, do not ask for details, uh, especially if you're in public or um, if there are details that involve um, something very graphic or something very traumatizing. Um, so we've experienced this um, so many times um, in virtue of what we do, um, but sometimes there are um, details that the police want to ask that basically put a, a stop to the progress of an interview or um, a session where somebody's sharing their stories. Um, just because if people are not ready to share those details, um, that means that we just need to give them more time and not force, force them. Also, the timing um, of when we try to allow people to tell their stories, make space for their stories. It's never um, good to start these type of um, conversations at night um, because we cannot anticipate what's going to happen and how uh, this is going to go. And we do not want to create um, a state of tension or of shock um, and then be in the position where we have to leave um, and just let that person be by themselves for the whole night. Also, our entire attention should be on the, the person who's sharing. So very important not to look away, um, not to check our watches, not to answer our phones. And obviously, these are things that we probably think, well, of, of course, it's common sense, right? But when you are in an environment where maybe you have counseling sessions and there's one after the other, um, it's very important to um, leave space um, for people to be able to share without feeling like they're uh, burdening you or like they're um, intruding on your schedule. Instead of asking questions, it's important to reflect um, what the person has said. And this means that we might want to repeat um, some of the, the things just to make sure that we've understood well. Um, maybe reformulate, use different, um, different words, but this would give them um, a feeling that they're being listened. Um, and it also gives them the opportunity to correct us if we've misunderstood. Um, if there's um, a lot of tension, if there's tears, if there are um, feelings that are being expressed uh, in a very powerful way, it's okay to take breaks actually. It's okay to um, allow people to stop. As I said, we don't necessarily need to go through um, a whole story from beginning to end just um, in a certain time frame. But make sure that we, we need to make sure that we actually um, tell people about these things and that people know that it's okay to, to stop whenever they don't feel um, count, uh, comfortable. Um, also, making sure that the person is present. So not only do we need to be present and not check time or phones or something else, but if we feel like the person is drifting away or slipping away, um, there are certain grounding techniques that we can use. So for example, calling the person by their name, creating a sense of intimacy, of um, a sense of um, closeness, bringing them back to, to the present and not allowing them to go back to uh, when the trauma has happened because Remember, traumatic experiences can feel like they're continuing even when you're talking about them. So something as simple as um, calling their name and reminding them what you were doing is extremely important. 
also um, try to anticipate this. And I know that sometimes people will come up to you and just out of nowhere, they will start telling you their stories. And this is um, part of the way that um, this works with people who have this calling, like people know that they can come to you and they can trust you. And maybe you just wanted to say hi in the hallway at the church and they just start, um, you know, telling you the, the story of their lives. Um, but making sure that there's an environment in which um, they can feel safe, they can feel comfortable, they have the privacy, um, they will have the your full attention and um, your full care is very important. And this means, um, you know, telling them or setting, setting the space um, ahead, offering a glass of water, even you can have a, um, a glass of water or go for a walk or create um, this space where uh, people can tell their stories um, in a way that it can be um, healing and it can also check um, the other things. So, wow. <laughs> um, there goes my plan for 30 minutes of questions. So I'm going to go back here. Hopefully, um, I'm looking at the, the questions here. There are no open questions. Are you guys even there anymore? <laughs> You know, it's, it's very tricky because you all can see me, but I cannot see you and I cannot see your reactions. So hopefully you are not all. Yeah, asleep. I don't see, I don't see any questions there either. Would you like for me to, to uh, invite people to a discussion with, uh, with the microphones and with asking questions out loud now? Oh, we got a question. Yes, absolutely. If it's, um, yes, there is a question, please. Um... From your experience, do people tend to bring God into the conversation, blame God or are angry with God? Oh my goodness. Um, yes, that happens. Um, and, you know, it's, it's something that we cannot control, um, but it goes back to... Um, building the or creating the safe place if people feel anger and right now it's pointed towards god that's part of the um way that they react so um we saw that the the way that they see the pulp perpetrator is altered the way that they see community is altered and the way that they see god is altered by their experiences so um they're gonna be angry and you know, it's fine for them um, to be angry as long as we're able to also speak truth into that and not in a way where we're trying to, to correct them. So we hear them, we acknowledge what they're feeling, but then we also um, speak truth to them. I hope that that makes sense if I'm not answering. Okay, how can it be sense that the person is not lying so we can help them out in the correct way? Um, by giving it time. <laughs> um, so I guess in certain, um, certain environments, it's easier because that person comes recommended um, by the police in some cases or by social workers. Uh, but with, when somebody's just coming up to you and you feel like their story might not be true, um, it might be that... Um, it actually isn't true and they're fabricating facts or it might be that the trauma has been um, so intense that they're not actually um, able to voice everything that has happened and their story is going to change a few times before you actually get the real story. Um, so give it time, uh, use your discernment, but don't automatically uh, dismiss it just because it seems like it's um, it's ridiculous or just because a few times they've contradicted themselves. So what we experience specifically with human trafficking victims, they will change their testimonies before we actually um, know what's, what's happening or what has happened to them. Um, can you say a little more about how we may help people with chronic shame? Um, what from your experience help people manage shame? <laughs> okay. Um, 
I think there's someone who has unmuted themselves by mistake. Here we go. Um, how do we help people deal with chronic shame? Um, with a lot of um, patients. Um, so I, I've seen where you are, um, where you are based in. One thing that I can tell you is that we see um, a lot in Romania that we're a shame-based culture. So shame is very much ingrained in us, um, even from school. Like if you don't do something or if you do something wrong or if you don't know an answer, the first thing that you're being told is you should be ashamed of yourself. So very much this is how uh, we're raised and this is how um, we end up responding to, to things. So um, this is very much rewiring how people think um, of them of themselves it's about the, the identity um, so dealing with chronic shame is the same with um, dealing with other um, other types of lies so shame um, has to do with your identity right so guilt is something that um, you experience because you've done something um, but then uh, shame very much talks about who you are. So the best way of dealing with it is by reframing how that person sees themselves. And for us, it's about um, calling out the identity that God has um, for that person, making sure that those people understand that, you know, there is not an answer to the, the question, why has this, why, why did I allow this to happen? Because they have not allowed that. They have not brought it upon themselves. Um, and this is not something that um, was a, a result of, of who they were. It's actually the responsibility of the other person. Um, and I know that this very much sounds like, you know, preaching to the choir, but it's, this is what we need to do the same way that, um, how do you identify someone with partial amnesia during trauma? Um, they're not going to remember certain details. Um, so instead of just, cat, you know, um, cataloging it as uh, they don't want to share it, um, we need to, to be aware that um, this is very much a result of what has happened to them. They won't be able to recall certain um, details until they um, actually get to process some of the things that has happened to them. Um, in case in a case where you know the perpetrator and you know they are still harming the victim but the victim doesn't want to report it to the author authorities and you can do so yourselves because that will be break the trust of the victim what do you do um so this very much depends on what is happening it depends on um the um, the quality in which you're helping the victim and it depends on the victim. So if it's a minor, um, we do not talk about breaking trust. <laughs> um, we need to report that um, depending on the country in which you're based. Um, you might actually um, have to do that um, by law. Uh, it might be the law that you need to do that. So when it comes to minors, actually, um, that is a non-negotiable. Um, also, it depends on um, the, yeah, so with this, um, it, very, it very much depends. So if it's something illegal um, that is happening, I can give you an example of um, how we would handle it if it would be a, a trafficking case. Um, Basically, we would explain that this is something that we need to, to report. Um, and we understand that the person might not want to um, work uh, with us longer, but uh, we can refer them to someone else. However, um, we are... Um, we need to, to report it. So I'm sorry. Basically, if you are able to send me an 
an email or a message with um, more more details, I can tell you more about it. But just generally, if it's a minor, this is a non-negotiable. Uh, we report it anyways. And if it's something that is legal, that involves immediate harm to that person, uh, that goes to um, like life-threatening situations, um, we would report it. But if it's something that's more sensitive and that would actually impede the person from getting help afterwards if you did it, um, then this is a very tricky situation in which you need to work with the victim to understand that they are um, actually victims, that this is not normal, that there is help for them. Because a lot of times people do not want to report either because they're afraid of the consequences on themselves or on the people who are um, the perpetrators. Um, and just helping them understand that, um, you know, it's not their responsibility to figure out what's going to happen to the perpetrator. Um, and it, and there is help available for them. That's super important. Are there many success stories or do the company or group of helpers lose connection on the longer way? Um, it depends um, what you do and how you define success. Um, so, for example, in our organization, we do not um, have a shelter. We work mainly on prevention and advocacy. So we come alongside other organizations that have shelters and help people through volunteering um, or help them on a case-by-case -case basis. So, for example, one of the success indicators for us is that somebody can live a somewhat autonomous life. So they can get to the point where after receiving ter therapy and counseling, they can, for example, get a job. Um, so that for us is a success story. At the same time, depending on the type of trauma that they've experienced, um, maybe just the fact that a person can look you in the eyes and smile, that's also a success story because this person was so traumatized that they wouldn't even look up when they talk to you. Um, so we see enough um, to keep going, <laughs> but sometimes you just need to accept that some people are no longer going to want help. Some people are just going to cut you off. Um, and this is where understanding that our role is not to save them, it's to come alongside of them as long as God allows us to do so, and then trust that he's going to continue to care for them. Um, yeah, that's also one of the, the ways that this story goes. <laughs> I hope that I have covered all of the questions. Um, well, this is awesome. I see that a lot of you guys are doing some amazing things in the, um, the ministries that you're involved in and in the organizations that you're involved in. Um, I, I have a question for you, Jakub, I guess. Uh, mm -hmm. So the resources that I said I would want to share with the group, uh, do I just give them to you and you'll email everyone? Or yeah, how? yeah, yeah. The easiest way is that I will that all the people who were in and actually all the people who registered and, for example, didn't show up, all they all will receive it with the recording of this meeting. So yeah. Okay, great. Um, if there aren't any other questions. Um, I will end by saying thank you so much for tuning in. Um, I know it was a lot. I thought that I was going to look at the, the clock and it would only be 20 minutes, but then I realized that I spoke for like an hour nonstop. So hopefully um, you guys were able to follow up. But if you have other questions, you will get these resources and um, you can have my, my contact info um, and if there's something that I can help you with, or if you have particular questions that we can follow up with, um, I would love to do that.